Thank you for joining us for our final Ignite Startup Workshop for the Spring 2021 semester. My name is Amanda Golden and I'm the Program Manager in the Herb Kelleher Entrepreneurship Center in the Macomb School of Business. The Herb Kelleher Entrepreneurship Center promotes the development of entrepreneurial skills and supports the exploration of the ways in which those skills can be applied in careers as founders or innovators within established firms. Our Ignite Startup Workshops provide an opportunity for students to learn more about different topics related to new venture creation. These workshops host leaders from various industries and on-campus experts and enable students, faculty, staff, and the larger entrepreneurial community to gain usable skills and insights for launching an idea into a startup or pursuing other career opportunities. Today, we are excited to welcome Catherine Turpin and Tucker Villarreal to discuss the top legal mistakes startup founders make and ways to avoid them. I should note as we begin that Tucker and Catherine will be taking questions from the audience as they work through the presentation. So as questions come up, be sure to put them in the Q&A box um, along your Zoom toolbar. Catherine Turpin is a senior corporate and transactional attorney with experience working with a spectrum of businesses from the startup community to the medium-sized company. She is licensed to practice law in both Texas and California, and she has handled a wide variety of commercial transactions, including general business transactions, acquisitions and sales of businesses, and technology agreements. Catherine works with companies to help them identify the proper ownership structure, and then to implement their plan for doing business. In this role, she creates form agreements for the business and documents the relationships between the business and its customers, vendors, or business partners, as well as the relationship between the business owners and employees or consultants. Catherine views her relationship with clients as a collaborative effort with the goal of making her client's business run as smoothly as possible. Tucker Villarreal joined Richards Rodriguez and Spieth LLP in September 2019, following a year-long clerkship with the firm. Tucker provides a wide variety of legal services, including guidance on commercial transactions, ent entity structure, mergers, sales and acquisitions, technology agreements, corporate governance, and outside general counsel services. Tucker graduated from the University of Texas at Austin and received his undergraduate degree in government and history. He went on to attend the University of Texas School of Law, graduating in May of 2019 and passing the Texas State Bar exam in the fall of that year. During his time at the University of Texas School of Law, Tucker served as the research editor for the Texas International Law Journal. Catherine and Tucker, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and we are um, delighted to be doing this and we hope that everyone will find this interesting and informative, that's the whole idea. And I'm gonna um, also share my screen so people can see our one, um, we don't have a very complicated uh, presentation, but this should give everyone with um, an overview of the top legal mistakes that entrepreneurs and business owners make. And um, uh, let Amanda know in the, uh, I guess the chat section, if you can't see that. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Tucker and he's gonna start off with the first uh, top mistake that entrepreneurs make. Right, so yeah, so number one, we have immediately forming a Delaware C Corporation. So we hear many entrepreneurs in the clinic ask about whether they should form a Delaware C Corp or that they've already formed a Delaware C Corp and what they should do next. So we thought it'd be a good idea to discuss why this entity structure is likely not the best for you. So here are the cons to the Delaware C Corp. To incorporate in Delaware, you must have a presence there, which means you'll need to hire a registered agent in Delaware. You're gonna to have to pay franchise taxes in Delaware, and you're gonna to have to follow any filing requirements in Delaware. But the likelihood is that your company will only be doing work in the jurisdiction you primarily, primarily do business in. So I'll just assume Texas here. So where you're gonna also have, a, have to have a registered agent there, and you can, but you might have to hire one. Um, you have to pay franch Texas franchise taxes, and you have to follow Texas filing requirements. So this means, that you'll have to pay to work 
in two states when in all likelihood you'll only work in one state at first for probably a while. It, additionally, the C corporation form is not always best suited for startups. Just because some investors prefer C corporations and just because large companies like Amazon have a Delaware C Corp form, for example, does not mean that this entity form is right for your situation. The corporate form is more rigid and formalistic than other forms like the limited liability company or the LLC. So you may want to consider the benefits of being nimble at this young stage. And lastly, there are tax consequences in forming a corporation that are not present in forming an LLC. Though we're not tax attorneys, you may be missing out on many upfront deductions by making this choice. However, of course, there are pros to choosing the Delaware C Corp. The Del Delaware has a well-established court of chancery that specializes in business law and that is owner-friendly. Delaware also has greater privacy requirements in disclosing names of directors and officers. Also, large investors prefer the Delaware C Corp form because of these reasons I just stated and more. But that all being said, unless you have a big time investor who is wanting your company to be a Delaware C Corp, or you can, with certainty, see that your company will be working in multiple jurisdictions from the get-go, the Delaware C Corp is likely not the way you should go. But also keep in mind that you can always convert your Texas entity to a Delaware C Corp if and when it becomes appropriate and beneficial for you. There will be costs associated with this, but the conversion should pay off if you're doing this to gain a large investor, for example. So instead, form your company in the state that you will do most of your business in and choose a form that best fits you, which is more than likely an LLC. That was um, that was very helpful, um, uh, Tucker, and that was um, I, absolutely true. That uh, you can always convert a Texas corporation to a Delaware corporation or an entity formed in any other state. So thanks, that was very helpful. Um, uh, so I'm I'm going to discuss the second mistake that um, entrepreneurs and business owners make, and that's not forming an entity soon enough. So I think we all know, um, but bears repeating, that the main reason you want to form an entity when you are starting a business is to protect your personal assets from your business debts. And if, if you start a business without forming an entity, you, you have a sole proprietorship. All of the business income and expenses are your personal income and expenses, and um, you're personally liable for all of your business debts. So um, if you start a business that, say, provides um, motivational or educational seminars and you sign a contract at a big hotel for um, a hotel conference room for $5,000, if you don't have a business entity, that's a personal debt and you're personally responsible for that $5,000 fee. Um, so, so that's the main reason to form an entity. Not every, um, not every situation or at least um, not everyone needs to form an entity right away when they start a business. It really depends upon the risk profile of the business that you're gonna be conducting. So I see two situations in which you you would be much better off to go on and form an entity as soon as you start your business. And the first is if your business involves a, a fairly high risk profile. Like if you're gonna be selling packaged um, consumable goods to consumers, uh, like um, prepackaged drinks or prepackaged food, um, if you're gonna be operating a restaurant or selling alcohol, um, or if you're going to be providing transportation like a taxi cab service, all those kinds of businesses involve some potential um, uh, significant liability. So in that situation, you'd be better off to go on and form an entity to operate your business. Um, the second situation where you, 
it would um, be much better to go on and form an entity as soon as you start business is if you're starting a business with one or more other co-owners. So um, under Texas law, uh, when uh, more than two people get together to run a business, you have automatically created a partnership um, uh, between the owners. And there's two defining features of a partnership that you should be aware of. So the first is that each partner has the ability to sign contracts and bind the entire partnership to contracts and liabilities and to incur debts on behalf of the partnership. And the second feature is that each, or, uh, each partner can be held to be personally responsible for 100% of the debts of the partnership. So if you have a partner who's gone out and signed a big contract for the partnership, um, incurring some significant debt, and then your partner decides to um, leave the business or move to Australia, you could be personally liable for um, to fulfill that contract and to pay the vendor or the supplier for whatever the fees are, even if you weren't the one to sign that contract. So um, uh, it, it, it's a much better idea if you're going to go into business with one or more other people to go on and form an entity as soon as you've started business. And um, that's a good way to protect your personal liability uh, or to protect your personal assets. Um, Tucker, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, you're muted. I was muted. So sorry, Catherine. No, I, I think that was great. really, really great. And um, I'll just go ahead and jump into our third topic. Great. So our third topic is creating additional entities without having a plan and without evaluating whether multiple entities are necessary or a good idea. So we have seen many entrepreneurs and clients come to us with several entities created under their belt, but with no clear direction as to why they did this. There are many benefits of creating multiple ent entities, which I'll touch on, but you should only do so by having a plan in place. We of course suggest that you talk to a business attorney like ourselves to get this counseling before you do anything on your own. Doing so will help you avoid paying any unnecessary legal and filing costs in merging your entities, transferring assets and equity around, dissolving any unnecessary entities and other necessary steps to achieve the benefits that I will discuss. <laughs> in addition, we have many clients in this situation get their entities mixed up when they do transactions on their own. So this sort of unorganized entity structure can really add up and having uh, to clean up mistakes of not structuring your entities correctly. <clears throat> so as a general statement, most entrepreneurs will only need one entity to start their business and they should stick with that entity until their business begins to develop more. Once this happens, again, talk to a business attorney on what to do next so you can take your business to the next level. So the problem with creating multiple entities without having a plan is that you lose the potential benefits that arise from structuring your entity in a sound way. So here are the benefits. First one is asset protection and, and increased limited liability. If one of your businesses fails, you can board up that one without the risk to others because those other, in, other entities will typically not be on the hook for the failed entity. For example, if you have a real estate business, you can have your holding company hold the real estate as an asset and have it lease that property back to another company that is operating or developing that real estate. So if your operating company begins to fail, the real estate that it is developing will not be subject to creditors as it is <clears throat> instead the property of the holding company. Another benefit is that it's easier to sell one of your entities. If one of your businesses is doing well and you're in the position to sell it, it'll be easier to sell that entity if it is not tied up in a messy relationship with all of your other entities that a potential buyer is not interested in. For example, say you have one company that sells widgets and it also conducts research and development. 
the buyer comes along and wants to purchase the company because the widgets are very successful. However, you don't want to sell the company because you still need your, your R&D business to develop more successful ideas like the widgets. Now you're in a situation where your buyer wants to purchase the whole company, but you only want a part of it sold, and that's problematic to you. Because to solve this, you should have created, say, three companies. One is the holding company who owns two companies, which is the widget company and the R&D company. Now, when that buyer comes along, you can easily sell off, sell off that widget company without the issues of the prior scenario. <clears throat> and, and lastly, another benefit is that distinct entities can lead to preferable tax treatment because spreading your income across multiple entities can help bring down your overall taxable income. And so we advise everyone to talk to an accountant to make sure that your company is receiving the best tr tr tax treatment it can from forming its entities correctly. So to conclude, though it might seem tedious at first, taking the time to think and plan about how your business should be structured can lead to early wins that will have long lasting benefits in the future. What do you think, Catherine? <laughs> Are you muted? Uh, there I am. I did the same thing that you did. <laughs> um, so um, we had a, a question about a sole proprietorship and um, for someone who's self-employed and if forming an LLC would still protect um, their personal assets. Absolutely. Um, you can, if, if you have uh, your own business, and even if it's just one owner, if you form an entity, an LLC or a corporation, to operate that business um, and you follow all the rules about and you respect the integrity of the entity that means that you really you keep up all filings you um, suitably form the entity uh, having the entity the LLC operate your business will help protect your personal assets and there's always exceptions, but that's that's a good general rule to um, mm. to follow. Um, so the next uh, big mistake that uh, we'll talk about is, um, and this is a really big mistake that I see often, is not having a written agreement between the co-owners of a business. And here, this can apply to a corporation or to an LLC. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if there are two more founders, they should really form a separate entity when they start the business. And to, to, to form an entity, it's just a filing some paperwork with the Secretary of State of Texas, and that's pretty simple. But that's only half of the um, half of really forming your entity. Um, you also need to complete um, owner agreements between the owners. And this is best done when the, when the business is young, everyone's getting along, everyone feels really great about the business and each other. And that's the time when the owners should get together and discuss and decide how they're gonna handle when things come up or, and, uh, and how they're gonna handle contingencies and problems when they come up. So a perfect example of this is with a client I'll call Joe. And Joe came to me with a problem um, with his 50% co-owner, Clarence. And Clarence had essentially stopped working with the business. He had stopped coming in. He'd stopped responding to emails. But he was still a 50% owner. So he was still collecting 50% of all the profits of the company without doing anything. So Joe said, what can I do? I want to either buy his interest or I want to fire him. And um, because they didn't have, they didn't spend the time to come up with a company agreement or a shareholders agreement, Joe had no way to force Clarence to um, start pulling his weight or to, um, Joe had no right to demand that Clarence sell Joe Clarence's interest. So Joe was kind of stuck. So without an agreement or rights of first refusal, um, you you can end up in a situation that is, um, uh, well, that you could end up in a deadlock like with Joe and Clarence. 
So when you're forming a business with other people, it's such a good idea early on to put in place a contract that covers things like, do the owners have specific duties that they are required to fulfill? Or is everyone required to contribute a minimum amount of hours to the business? Um, what if an owner just decides that they're done with the business and they want to move or um, they really don't want to be involved in the business anymore? Do the other owners, uh, are they required to buy out that owner? Do they have a right of first refusal? Um, what happens if an owner dies? Do the other owners get to buy um, that deceased owner's interest from the estate or do the heirs get to acquire that equity? Um, and is an owner free to sell her shares to a third party or do the other owners have a right of first refusal? So um, these are um, questions that are, um, uh, that an owner agreement can resolve ahead of time. And, and it makes perfect sense that you should go on and try to resolve them when everyone's feeling good about the business and feeling good about each other. Um, and whether you have a corporation or an LLC, um, this kind of an owner agreement will just help um, avoid nasty disputes and the situation like Joe and Clarence, um, uh, and it'll help your business thrive. And I think that's kind of, um, anyway, I see that um, that is a very common mistake by entrepreneurs and business owners. So Tucker, I think you're next. Yes, thanks, Catherine. And I, we have questions, but uh, they're, they're, they're for prior uh, topics. So maybe we'll, we'll get to those uh, maybe at the end. So let, let's just keep on going. Um, <clears throat> so the fifth topic we have is when there is more than one owner or founder, and how do you divide the equity of that company? So it is common to see founders want to split the equity of their company evenly. But this is almost always a mistake. Equal shares may seem fair, but this can lead to deadlock and inequitable distributions of a company's success, which in turn can lead to failure. <clears throat> so for, for example, say you have four founders of company XYZ. The first founder is a person who came up with the idea and is an expert in the field. The second is this person who is business savvy and will figure out how to get funding. The, the third is the person who's helping person number one with the product and but is committing their entire life to this venture. And person number four, he was just he was a person who was just there at the right place at the right time and had some uh, upfront capital. So do you think that each of these four founders deserves 25% of the equity? Does person one, the, who's the person with the idea and the expertise, does, this, does he or she deserve the same as person four? Was, that was the person who was there at the right time and had some money to fund the company at first? I, I hope everyone here would, would see that how that, that's problematic and not the right way to form your business. Instead, we suggest that everyone take some time and research the Founders Pi Calculator, which, which is something that was created by Frank Dimler at Carnegie Mellon University. And this is a process that involves factors of how equity should be distributed between founders based on a mathematical formula. And here is a very brief overview of how it works. So there's five factors. The first one is the idea. The second is the business plan preparation. The third is domain expertise. Four is commitment and risk. And five is responsibilities. And these factors are all scaled on importance from zero to 10. So for, but for each company, each distinct company, the relative importance of these factors will be different. For example, the idea for a tech company will be much higher compared to, say, a restaurant. And the business plan preparation for a company that needs funding will be much higher than one where the founders are providing startup capital. So to calculate 
the founder's equity. Each founder is evaluated on each of these factors based on a scale of zero to 10 as well. You next multiply the founder's values for each factor by the factor's values and then add them up for each founder and then add them up for <clears throat> then add every founder's value to have a grand total. The total number of each founder's values is then divided by the grand total and made into a percentage. This then becomes the equity percentage that each founder should initially re receive. So briefly back to our example, I assure, you, assure you that once the calculation is done for each of the factors for company X, Y, and Z, uh, for, and for each of the found four founders, the equity distribution will not be even. <clears throat> so again, this is a very summarized version of this calculation. And there are also many resources out there about this topic, as many people have discussed this process and expounded on it in detail if you want to learn more. But to conclude, we believe that this process is, is easy enough to understand and worth it that every company with multiple founders should use this process instead of dividing the equity evenly. Boy, thank you, Tucker. I, I, I'm a big fan of the um, founders uh, equity pie calculator and it's um, the, the one thing that I will add to that is um, when founders get together and they have to go through this process of what is each founder's contribution to the company, what will that be and what is the relative value of those contributions to the company, it, it, it can be an uncomfortable conversation, um, but if the founders can't work through that uncomfortable conversation, uh, they probably shouldn't be doing business together. Yep, so exactly. just the process of discussing this um, will help develop the communication and the trust and everything else um, among the founders. Right. Um, um, okay, so the next uh, top mistake that we're gonna talk about is um, not using vesting for granting of equity. And I think vesting is such an important concept and tool for any entrepreneur or business owner to understand and to use. And vesting can be um, applied to uh, granting founder shares and or it can be applied for um, granting shares to employees uh, later down the road in the um, uh, in the history of the company. Um, and investing is most useful for granting equity to someone whose contribution is going to be future services instead of cash or property that is contributed to the company right then and there. Um, and some of you may already understand and know everything about vesting, but I'll, I'll give a quick overview and a quick example. So, um, uh, let's say a founder, excuse me, a startup has three founders, and the first founder is going to be contributing software that he developed to the company, and the second founder is going to be um, contributing cash to the company, and the third founder is going to be handling all of the sales and marketing and business development um, activities to the company over the next five years. Um, well, in the first place, they should probably work through the founder's pie equity to decide what their relative ownership will be. But also, um, the first two um, founders who are giving cash or property, their shares should be immediately vested in the company. The third founder, who's not really going to be earning his shares, um, uh, or rather will be earning those shares over five years as his services are being um, provided to the company, his shares should vest. And it would look something like this. If he's ultimately supposed to have 100 shares, his shares could vest 20 shares per year um, for each of five years. So at the end of five years, he has 100 vested or permanent shares. And if he leaves... The company um, uh, uh, after a year and one month of working there, 
he will have earned or he will be vested as to 20 of those shares, but not the full 100 of his shares. So um, that, that's the concept of vesting. And that example um, describes vesting um, over time. You can also structure uh, equity that vests um, based upon the achievement of milestones. Um, and that would look something like of the um, 100 shares that are to be uh, granted to that founder who's going to be contributing future services, 50 of those shares will vest um, once the company has reached $1 million in revenues or has um, signed a contract with the 500th customer, something like that. And, and you can do a combination of time and performance vesting. Um, um, and, and most of my startup clients will use vesting for either early employees or perhaps for the vendors who, um, excuse me, for the founders who are gonna be contributing future services. Um, and I, I will also just um, mention that uh, my example of Joe and Clarence, if Joe had used um, vesting for Clarence, uh, so Clarence was gonna be providing all of these services in the future, uh, Joe wouldn't have been stuck because Clarence would have only acquired maybe one fifth of the shares that Joe was willing to give him. Uh, so I, I, I can't tell you how many clients have come to me and they haven't used vesting and they've had an employee who was granted shares too soon and too many shares. And then like Joe, they end up kind of being stuck in um, an unfortunate situation with their business. So um, that's vesting. Right. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Catherine. Um, okay, I'll go to our next topic. Um, this is not having a written agreement in place with contractors or consultants who are creating content or intellectual property for the business. As you may know, a company's intellectual property or, or IP it can be one of the, the most important assets a company has. And, and Catherine will discuss the importance of protecting your IP as soon as possible after this. <clears throat> But for this topic, I'll, I will focus on the scenario where a company outsources the creation of their IP to a third party, say for to create the company's logo or to create some software for the company. So in the situation where you yourself are, are not creating your company's IP, you will likely need to have one of your employees to do this, or you'll need to hire a contractor. Having an employee do this function is typically ideal because anything your employee creates as part of their job is the legal property of the employer. But you might not be in the position where you can support having employees for this or any matter at first because having employees can be expensive. Instead, what you'll need to do, which is what a lot of startups do, is to hire independent contractors. However, however, the difference with a contractor is that their creations are legally their own and not your company's, at least at first. This is true even if the IP is made within the scope of the contractor's engagement or on the work side of the employer, your, your company. So to avoid this problem, you wanna make sure that whatever IP that this contractor is creating will wind up belonging to your company and not the contractor. So the first step to make sure that this happens is to of course have a written agreement in place. However, you need to make sure that this agreement also contains provisions regarding the assignment of the IP. Now, this agreement should state that whatever IP that the contractor is making for you is assigned over to the company and that the contractor has no ownership rights over it. Good, because if you don't do this, the contractor can come back and claim ownership of that IP, and you might not, you might be put in the situation of not being able to use it, or you'll have to co-own the IP with the contractor, or you will have to pay a licensing fee to use the IP for something that you 
already paid for it to begin with. So it is incredibly important that when your company deals with service providers or independent contractors for the purpose of creating IP for your company, that there be written agreements in place that contain assignment provisions for intellectual property. And more, as I will discuss another topic, having a written agreement in place with any independent contractor or service provider is crucial in establishing your relationship with them. All right, Catherine. All right, great. Thank you, Tucker. Yeah. Um, so um, on a related um, uh, topic, um, the next kind of common thing we see that's unfortunate is when um, an entrepreneur or business doesn't pursue protection of the intellectual property that's owned by the business soon enough. Um, and I, I include in that also maybe not understanding uh, the IP that the company owns and what is what of that IP is worth protecting. Um, so clearly IP can consist of patents, trademarks, copyrights, and good old fashioned trade secrets. So um, we, we, uh, we know that if your business has patentable intellectual property, um, uh, or if you think that your business has patentable intellectual property, you should actually pursue the patent fairly soon. I mean, um, you know, that should be one of the first things you do with your business. Um, and a patent attorney, uh, that would not be Tucker or me, can help you determine whether your um, invention or development or business process is patentable, um, what the cost will be, uh, what the challenges will be. And you should pursue that and set aside money in your legal budget to, um, to pursue this. And if you can get a patent, you should go in and do that as soon as you possibly can. Um, the second kind of intellectual property that can be valuable to a company uh, is a company's trademark. Now, it's easier to change a trademark than it is a patent. Um, and a trademark is just a name or logo that is associated with the sale of, of goods or services. Um, before you start investing a ton of money in developing your brand and your logo, I would highly recommend having um, a trademark search conducted and make sure that there's not a similar mark or logo in your industry that would prevent you from um, fully using your desired trademark. But once that, once your trademark is clear, you can file um, an application for your mark with the trademark, with the US Trademark Office on an intent to use basis. So this is kind of like reserving the mark for you. Now, once you actually start using your trademark um, in connection with your good or service, you have to submit a, an example of, of what your mark looks like and, and how it's used in commerce, but your protection will go back to the date of first filing. So, so that's an important thing to do if your business, uh, rather if your trademark is gonna be an important part of your business model. Now, the, the next kind of IP is copyrights. Um, and copyrights is, is just, um, just applies to written works like a script or a book. Um, and it doesn't apply or it's not all that relevant for many businesses, but if your business is um, providing uh, educational material or curricula to um, institutions or to um, individuals, then your business and its value is based upon those written works. And you should, you should register your copyright in your, your written materials as soon as you've created them. And, and we won't go into um, why, but you do get extra protections with registering your, your copyright with the Copyright Office. Um, the last kind of IP is, is um, owned by every business. And uh, this is the um, intellectual property that I see that is less sufficiently protected than others. And that's just trade secrets. And by trade secrets, I mean your idea, your business methods, 
the way you pull together other products to create your product or the way you provide your special services. And, and those things are not protectable like a patent or a trademark or a copyright, um, but you can protect them by well keeping them secret and only disclosing them if you've got an NDA with the other party. So I highly recommend that when you, if you have a business and you have some of these trade secrets, as soon as you start talking with a vendor, a customer, or even someone who wants to um, become a founder in your business and invest money in your business, you get them to sign an NDA that they agree that they're not gonna use or disclose any information that they learn from you. And um, so if they do go out and steal your idea and steal kind of your, um, special secret methods of doing business, uh, you at least have some recourse. And um, NDAs are inexpensive. Uh, you can find some on the web, um, but, but you need to use a good solid non-disclosure agreement for that purpose. And um, uh, I think that's it for the, for the protecting your intellectual property. Yes, thanks Catherine, yeah, that's Thank you. Good. Thank you for stressing the importance of the NDA. It's, it might see, again, it might seem tedious at first, but it is very much worth it, guys. All right, so for number nine, we, we have the general not having a clear employment practices. <clears throat> so to start off, misclassifying your employees, independent contractors, is a problem for your company and your worker. So categorizing a worker in the wrong category can potentially lead to tax utilities for you and the loss of benefits for your worker. So for example, if you misclassify a worker as an independent contractor when they should have been classified as an employee, you can be on the hook for any of that, that worker's overtime or, and, and employment taxes that, that this worker should have been benefited from from the beginning. So to figure this out, the, the IRS uses three factors to determine this. The first one is behavioral control. So that's, does the company control or, or have the, the right to control what the worker does and how the worker does his or her job? Second is financial control. So are the business aspects of the worker's job controlled by the payer? And which can include how the worker is paid, uh, whether it's expenses are reimbursed and who provides their tools or supplies, et cetera. And also, is this the worker's sole source of income? And then three is the relationship between the parties. So are there written contracts or employee type benefits, like i.e. pension plans, insurance, vacation pay, et cetera. And will the relationship continue? And is this work performed a key aspect of the business? So, you need to use these factors in, in making the determination of your worker sooner rather than later. And if you're having a hard time figuring out this, this determination, you can always contact an attorney like ourselves to help you with that. Because the repercussions of misclassifying your worker can be devastating to a young business. So take the time to clarify this relationship as soon as possible. So to also help with this misclassification problem, it is always best to have a written agreement between your employees or independent contractors in your company that clearly lays out the worker's duties, pay, termination, anything else that needs to be clarified from the beginning. But what I find particularly important in these types of agreements is the termination section. The default termination rules can be messy and unclear. So, you want to establish a concise agreement between everyone on how and when termination will occur. Uh, we've had many clients come with, come with us with issues like this and the re repercussions can just be serious. So to also help further define the relationship of your company in your workers is to have in place something like a, an employee handbook or company policies or, or guidelines uh, because that these can help clarify and inform your workers of what is expected of them by your company. So like having an employee handbook in place is great to incorporate into uh, an employment agreement. So for example, if an employee violates this, then there are clear grounds to have that employee disciplined or, or terminated. 
and this, this is especially useful if your employee is in a protected class as th this can be a way to prove that the termination of that employee was not due to any prejudice against them that goes against the law. And moreover, these can also just help flush out your expectations of your workers, which in turn should lead to better business success. All right, Catherine, last but not least. Um, uh, yeah, you know, the relationship with employees for any business owner um, is, uh, is, is really just critical and making sure your employees feel like they're treated fairly um, mm -hmm. will uh, certainly lead to um, business success, more likely to lead to business success. So this last mistake, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this because uh, I want to make sure we have time to answer some of the questions. But this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and is something that I've, I've spent um, a lot of time on in my career. And that's... Um, the issue of documenting the business relationship that uh, the relationships that a business has with all of these third parties and the mistake that uh, an entrepreneur and business owners make in not taking care and adequately documenting those relationships. Now, when I talk about business relationships, I mean the, the business relationship that you're going to have with your customers and your suppliers, maybe your distributor. Um, maybe your strategic partners, also your employees and your advisors. Um, all, all of those people uh, you have a business relationship with and being clear about how that relationship works is pretty important um, part of the success of your business. So, and, and um, the ideal world is you'd have a contract with each one of those third parties, but um, you're not going to have a written agreement with each one of those parties, but here's just to kind of summarize what the purpose of a contract is, and that's to clarify expectations so everyone knows what's expected of them and what they can expect from the other party. Um, a contract will create the roadmap for how the parties are supposed to act. Like you think about a distributor, when is the distributor, what rights do they have, um, of what, when, when are they supposed to do their uh, when are they supposed to perform and when are they going to be paid? Um, you can also, in a contract, incentivize certain actions. Let's say like you give a customer a 5% discount if they pay early, or you give um, a supplier some sort of a benefit if they will deliver goods on Mondays and Wednesdays instead of um, other days of the week that, that aren't as convenient for you. Um, and most importantly, contracts minimize misunderstandings between the parties. And when you minimize misunderstandings, uh, you are, you're going to minimize business disputes because the vast majority of bus business disputes come up because one party thought that they were supposed to do X and the other party thought they were supposed to do Y. And that's when you end up in either litigation or um, just expensive dispute, uh, expensive disputes and um, disruptions to your business. Um, and uh, uh, contracts, I think, are they're just an important thing to be clear. And the more complicated the con the relationship, uh, the more important it is to have a written agreement and probably also have a professional um, draft that agreement for you. Um, so with that, I think we can um, look for, so I've answered a couple of the questions uh, already online. Um, if you don't mind, Tucker, I'll take a couple of these and then you can go through and then answer a couple more. That'd be great. Um, uh, the first question is, what is a subchapter S corporation? Um, so subchapter S is a, uh, an election that a corporation can make to be um, for preferential tax treatment so that the income of the corporation is automatically passed through to all of the shareholders. And so we all hear that it avoids double taxation and that's really what subchapter S does. 
Um, the difference between that and an LLC is a pretty nuanced difference, but LLC is also considered a pass-through entity. And um, I, I don't think that uh, we can go through those um, very uh, nuanced differences here, but they are fairly similar, but there, there's some differences and uh, different situations. Uh, they're each uh, might be better for different situations. Um, um, Tucker, do you want to take one of the other questions that you see here or? <clears throat> Let's see, I was, I was looking. Um, so someone asked, is, is there a magic number for starting number of shares? There's some legal consequences in the future number of shares. I, I, I'm gonna say the answer is no. Um, I, I think you wanna, you wanna have enough shares so you know, so let's just call it a maybe a hundred thousand, I don't know, or ten thousand, whatever. It kind of depends what you want to do, and because you want to have enough that if you want to give people shares, that you don't have to amend your certificate of formation to do so. I, I find that that might be the the biggest issue is if you only had uh, you know ten shares or something like that. That that that's that's the problem could come around. Uh, Catherine, what do you think? Anything else? Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, and I had a client. They had a thousand shares that were authorized, and then they decided that they wanted to. They were bringing in an investor who was going to wanted to buy half the company, so five hundred shares. Well, we had to go through the process of amending the mm -hmm. certificate of formation, and um, then they brought in someone else. Then we had to amend the certificate of formation again. So right. you want to have enough shares to allow for future growth. Um, and it's off, it's common to authorize 10 million shares, a million mm -hmm. shares. So way more shares than you really need initially, right. just so you never, you don't have to always go back and amend your certificate. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, one person asked, uh, in a relationship without any money exchange, which is a lot of relationships uh, don't have any necessarily cash or money exchange. Can a memo of understanding be drafted to spell out the relationship? Absolutely. But you should be clear, a memo of understanding is still qualifies as a contract. Mm -hmm. um, a contract is, 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 there, um, is just an agreement between two parties. A contract can be verbal, it can be written, it can be created by course of contract. Um, so a memo of understanding that's just a bullet point list of terms of what one party is going to do, what the other party is going to do, how long will the relationship last, how do they terminate it, um, that is absolutely better than nothing. And it's, it's not the, you know, it doesn't, it's not 32 pages long, but it, to the extent that it clarifies people's expectation, I, I would definitely say that's better than not having that. So. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess on the, on the flip side, don't like, like, like you just said, Catherine, yeah, like, don't think that this isn't necessarily a contract because I've had people say, oh, no, this is just a memo of understanding. This wasn't a contract. This isn't binding. Like, well, it is <laughs> because of these reasons, you know? So anyways, right. uh, let's see. Um, uh, so the question about how much money should a business set aside for um, to protect it's IP patents or copyrights, boy. Um, I think uh, you would need to um, consult with your IP counsel, um, whether uh, to, to make sure that, well, A, to figure out what the risks of your intellectual property is, or is it too close to IP that's actually owned by other parties? And then what is the expense of lawsuits or claims? Um, so I, I can't give you that answer, but that is definitely a something that you should consult with and you should be able to get um, some good, good guidelines from your IP counsel. Um, and, and we have a, we have an attorney at our firm that's um, a very qualified and experienced IP counsel. And this is probably something that he does on a regular basis. So, right. Um, Let's see, uh, I'll take a couple of more questions. Um, if the business is 100% online or affiliate revenue based, what is the best entity? And does it matter if you set it up in Texas while living here? 
So there's kind of two aspects of this. Um, the best form of entity, um, I really like limited liability companies for a variety of reasons. Um, Tucker used the term nimble. I like, I, 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 I think that's an accurate um, description. Uh, you have so much flexibility to choose your um, the the way that the company is going to be taxed and the the relationship among the owners how that will work. Um, it is is not quite as rigid as a corporation. Um, so I I I generally tell my clients that an LLC is usually the better form of entity. There are some exceptions to that. And if you are based in Texas and you're going to remain based in Texas, I would think you'd be better off to just set up the entity in Texas. Because if you're based here, if you form an Iowa corporation and you're based here and you're running the business out of your home, you'd probably be required to register your business as a foreign entity here in Texas. So then all of a sudden you're making, uh, paying whatever taxes you have to pay. I don't know, what did I say, Iowa? It's in Iowa. <laughs> so in <laughs> Iowa and Texas, you have filings in Iowa, you have filings in Texas. So you have double administrative yeah. duties. Um, and, and you can always convert an entity from let's say a Texas entity to a California entity or to an entity in another state. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a little bit of money, but uh, um, but you always have that option. Right. So, and I, I see our moderator here. Yes, Catherine and Tucker, thank you. This has been very informative. We are unfortunately out of time, but I appreciate you both joining us today and, and providing <laughs> Um, this very helpful information for our attendees. Um, we will be sending out a recording. Um, so if you want to go back and, and you know, rewatch some of these tips or catch something you missed um, during today's webinar, you'll definitely have that opportunity. Um, again, Catherine and Tucker, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This was wonderful.